Hi, I'm Eric Boss, and Shazam is a wish-fulfilling escape from the doom and gloom of superhero cinema these days. A breath of fresh air that ain't 50% dust of Dead Avengers. This latest DC installment is filled with interesting Easter eggs and details that you might have missed. So let's re-watch it and break it down scene by scene for all these limited edition goodies. Spoiler warning if you haven't seen it yet, and let's get started. The opening scene introduces us to the film's villain, that is Savannah, a young boy bullied by his father and brother. In the comics, Dr. Savannah has appeared as a mad scientist, and in the more recent New 52 relaunch, a scientist on an archaeological expedition to save his family until being scarred with magic released from the tomb of Black Adam. More on him in a bit. But this film is further humanizing Savannah with this backstory, making him a parallel figure to the hero, Billy Batson. Kind of a worst case scenario if things played out differently for Billy. This flashback to 1974 opens with Bing Crosby's rendition of Do You Hear What I Hear, setting this story at Christmas time and reflecting the frustration of Savannah's character in this core memory, desperately begging the skeptics around him to hear what he heard and see what he saw. Savannah's father is played by John Glover, a longtime DC actor. He voiced the Riddler in Batman the Animated Series. He played Dr. Jason Woodrew, the scientist behind Poison Ivy and Bane in the beloved Batman and Robin. And he played Lex Luthor's father, Lionel Luthor, in Smallville. And he has looked exactly the same for three decades. Young Savannah's magic eight ball shows seven symbols, leading the father's car to blast to the rock of eternity, a sort of hub of all magic in the DC world. Its keeper is the wizard, whose name is actually Shazam, and he's played by Jaimon Hansu. Hansu's really triple dipping in the superhero films these days. He played supporting roles in Aquaman and Captain Marvel. And speaking of the name Captain Marvel, this is a reminder that Shazam's original name was Captain Marvel. He existed long before Marvel Comics Captain Marvel did. Shazam was actually one of the first DC superheroes to show up on the map. But over time, DC just decided to do the heroic thing and stick with the name Shazam to avoid the confusion. Not all heroes wear capes. Except this one does. As in the comics, the wizard is the surviving member of the Council of Eternity, seeking a champion to grant the power of the wisdom of Solomon, the strength of Hercules, the stamina of Atlas, the power of Zeus, the courage of Achilles, and the speed of Mercury. Take the first letter of all those gods and you got Chapton Marvel. Shouldn't the cave DC, of course, Shazam. This Rock of Eternity contains the seven deadly sins. Gluttony, greed, sloth, lust, pride, envy, and wraths in the box. These comics do love their lists. In the recent comics, these entities take sort of humanoid form with more personalities. Here, they're more demonic and monstrous. As Savannah enters this cave, there's a little cameo by this caterpillar-looking thing in a jar. This is actually the DC villain, Mr. Mind, a super intelligent telepathic worm who appears in the movie's post credit scene, but I made a whole other video explaining that post credit scene, so go watch it. Savannah gets tempted by the voices of the sins who take the eye of sin. And notice this shot as the eye gleams off his glasses lens. This blue light reflects over the exact spot where the orb will later scar his eye. So Savannah blows it and he returns to the car, freaking out and causing a wreck, carrying the kind of guilt that'll turn any kid into a supervillain, leading to the introduction of Billy Batson, played by Asher Angel. His hometown of Philadelphia is one of many details inspired by the New 52 relaunch of Shazam by Jeff Johns, including the Christmas time setting, Billy as a foster kid moving from home to home, his five foster siblings who all get Shazam powers as well, and specific plot points like the bully fight, wrecking the bully's car, and events set in the mall in a Christmas village. We first see Billy tricking cops by faking a pawn shop burglary. Now in this pawn shop, there's an Easter egg of the doll from Annabelle sitting on the shelf. This movie's director is David F. Sandberg. He's an emerging horror filmmaker who previously directed Annabelle Creation. The director, James Wan, has kind of taken him under his wing. And if you remember, Wan actually snuck his own Annabelle cameo into Aquaman. As Billy uses the police records to try to track down his stupid mom, we flash back to the moment this garbage person abandoned the child. At the carnival booth, young Billy wants a stuffed tiger, which is one of the many tiger nods in this movie, to Mr. Talkie Tani, an anthropomorphic tiger and friend to Shazam in the comics. As a teenager, you'll notice Billy's backpack has a tiger head on the back. Now, instead of this booth, Billy gets this compass ball prize. And it's interesting how this prop parallels the ball toy of the villain, Savannah, the Magic 8-Ball. The Magic 8-Ball is fake magic. It's a mere toy. And this artificiality reflects Savannah's unworthiness of magical powers. Whereas a compass ball, if you think about it, is actually linked to real natural forces, magnetism of the poles. And this reflects Billy's natural fit as champion. And that said, magic eight balls are way cooler. Compass balls are like for poor kids. Billy gets arrested and meets with this social worker, Emma Glover, played by Andy Osho. Osho actually played this same character in Sandberg's first feature, Lights Out, a feature version of his amazing short film. On Glover's desk are a bunch of yellow smiley faces. Sandberg said that behind the name tag is a bloodstained one, a nod to the iconic image from The Watchmen. Billy meets his new foster parents, Rose 
Sosa and Victor Vasquez, played by Marta Milans, and Cooper Andrews, aka Jerry from The Walking Dead. They take him home where he meets his foster siblings, Eugene Choi, played by Ian Chen, Darla Dudley, played by Faith Herman, Mary Bromfield, played by Grace Fulton, Pedro Pena, played by Hovind Armand, and Freddie Freeman, aka Eddie from It, and in my opinion, the MVP of this film. In the original Captain Marvel comics, Freddie and Mary were kind of sidekick characters, Captain Marvel Jr. and Mary Marvel, but in the more recent New 52 series, all five siblings make up the Marvel family. They all get powers. And these kids look remarkably similar to these actors, with the exception of Freddy not being blonde. Notice how the costume designers tend to dress all these kids in the exact colors that they later wear as their Shazam forms. You know, kind of like the Power Rangers. Look, Jason just liked red, okay? Also, little detail here, when Victor lifts the gaming headphones off Eugene's ear, you can hear the sound mixers dropped in a little Wilhelm scream. Freddy's room is wall-to-wall DCEU references. There's a wooden Superman toy on the shelf, a Batman v Superman Batarang replica, which comes back, a book titled The Bird in the Plane, The Impact of Superheroes on Society and Its Future, an authentic smush Superman bullet, newspapers with headlines about Zod's invasion and Man of Steel, the congressional hearing in Batman v Superman, and ones about LexCorp and Superman. Freddy wears an Aquaman t-shirt, the first of many Justice League shirts he'll wear throughout the film, and on the wall there's a framed newspaper with the headline, Superman is back, which we saw in the events of Justice League, and there are subheadlines, Amazon Woman and the Batman help combat Lex Luthor plans, suggesting a team up between Batman and Wonder Woman. Also, the aftermath, Gotham citizens pick up the pieces. And on the lower left, alien attack on the world, with the text underneath saying, the top suspect, as worldwide search begins for those responsible, specialists say early signs point to Lex Luthor and his associates. And all of these are hinting to the events following the near apocalypse of the Justice League film. You know, one that's a bit easy to forget, but you know, it plagued the Earth with swarms of parademons as Steppenwolf sought mother boxes to open up boom tubes and allow Darkseid to come to Earth. <laughs> Remember those days? It's interesting that this newspaper specifies Lex Luthor and his associates. It's a possible hint to Justice League's post credit scene, Evil Team Up, with Lex Luthor and Deathstroke, which many of us assumed would be the origin of the Legion of Doom in the DCEU. Unfortunately, it looks like those plans have been stalled at the moment. In general, this whole Shazam movie is fully integrated in the world of the DCEU. So these boys see everything through a lens of a reference base of DC, saying things like Cape Crusader stuff, and more powerful than a locomotive. Most of them are obvious, so I'm not gonna point them out. But it's also interesting that apparently Game of Thrones exists in this universe too. Freddy jokes with Billy about his disability, saying Victor put me, it gets real Game of Thronesy around here. He's referencing the first episode when Jamie Lannister pushed Bran out the window and paralyzed him. Moving on to adult Savannah, played by Mark Strong, interviewing others who, like him, encountered the wizard but were rejected as champions. Seeing the crazy experiences of alternate candidates is another new 52 inspiration. The comics show a random guy freaking out as his elevator blasts to the rock of eternity. There's actually a very interesting detail here, but first, this video was sponsored by ExpressVPN. A VPN allows you to browse the internet with privacy without things like ad companies, hackers, spyware, any of those annoying things tracking your data and secretly filtering your whole internet experience. ExpressVPN masks your IP address to make sure you aren't being monitored. So you can have that peace of mind. You can live life knowing no one is peeping on you. Personally, I use ExpressVPN because when I search for phrases like eye of sin and lust in the same hour, I don't want search engines and ad companies making any weird assumptions about what I want. It's just for work, guys. ExpressVPN is the fastest VPN on the market and the number one VPN service rated by Tech Radar. And if you're in a different country, you might not be able to access everything on Netflix or YouTube or other streaming services. But thanks to ExpressVPN, you can avoid those weird restrictions and just watch everything that you want to normally, the way the internet should be, wherever you are. ExpressVPN lets you securely stream or download content from anywhere, anytime, and it's less than $7 a month with a 30-day money-back guarantee. So take back your internet privacy today and find out how you can get three months for free by clicking on the link in the description box, ExpressVPN dot com slash new rock stars. That's E-X-P-R-E-S-S-V-P-N dot com slash new rock stars for three months free with one year package. Visit expressvpn dot com slash new rock stars to learn more. Take back your internet privacy today. Okay, Savannah works with Dr. Crosby, who researches mass delusions, and this character is actually a cameo by Lota Loston, Sandberg's real life wife. She starred in Sandberg's amazing horror short films and had cameos in the Lights Out feature and Annabelle Creation. Crosby's disintegration here is freaky. Amazing. 
She releases this haunting wail as her jaw collapses into ash. It's a reminder of how gifted Sandberg is at creating vivid horror, especially when it comes to horrible things happening to his wife. Savannah returns to the Rock of Eternity, this time embracing the Eye of Sin and giving in to the Seven Deadly Sins, which break out of their encasing statues, which crumble around them much like the way it does with the demons cracking out of their statues in the movie Ghostbusters. Billy, Freddy, and the others attend Fawcett Central School, which is a reference to Shazam slash Captain Marvel's previous hometown in the DC Comics Fawcett City, which was named after Fawcett Comics, the company that originally created the character before being bought out by DC. Freddy now wears an orange Batman shirt with the logo from the Batfleck era, and despite his sweet swag, the evilest bullies in the world attempt vehicular manslaughter on him and somehow don't go to jail in this movie. Instead, they just get like hit a few times by Billy and their car gets wrecked and they get suitcase wedgies. No, not enough. You run over someone with your car? That's a felony. And you target a kid with disabilities? It's a hate crime. Prison. Billy flees these assholes and his subway car shoots off to the Rock of Eternity. Notice that the jar previously containing Mr. Mind is now shattered and empty, setting up his return in the post credit scene. In this cave, you can also see a mirror. This is a nod to Francesca in the comics presence who appears to Billy in any reflective surface. The wizard explains to Billy the whole history of the Council of Eternity, who long ago chose a previous champion who betrayed them and released the Seven Deadly Sins into the world. Now he doesn't specify, but this past champion was actually Black Adam, the main antagonist to Shazam, who will be played in a future DC film by Dwayne The Rock Johnson. Left with no option to be picky about champions anymore, the wizard grants Billy his powers. Shazam? He turns him into the adult Shazam, played by Zachary Levi. Now, if you look closely, the clasps of his cape show tiger heads. Another talkie tawny nod. Shazam finds Freddy and freaks him out. This movie was pitched as Tom Hanks' Big meets Superman, and this plot point is straight out of Big. The scene when adult Josh scares his buddy Billy. Josh wins him over by performing their inside joke ice cream song. Billy wins over Freddy by bringing up the nerdy flight versus invisibility debate and showing him his stolen Superman bullet. Levi's portrayal of a kid trapped in an adult body is really well nuanced. And they did a really good job working in the expressions from the comics. Phrases like, holy moly, and gee whiz. Shazam uses his adultness to try to buy beer. Notice how the brand he buys is called Bersh with a plot. David Sandberg is Swedish, and Bersh, again, sorry about the pronunciation, it's Swedish slang for beer, kind of like the way we say brewski or things that my dad hides around the house. This leads to Shazam foiling a robbery, and small detail here that I liked the little dimples of the bullets make as they ricochet off his face. This leads to one of my favorite scenes in the movie. Savannah confronting the board of directors of his father and brother's company. David Sandberg's background as a horror filmmaker gave the scene such a dark tone. Notice that the board members look genuinely horrified when Savannah throws his brother out the window. Sandberg's work here reminds me a lot of Sam Raimi's direction of the first Spider-Man movie. Raimi was also better known for his practical horror in the Evil Dead movies, but like Sandberg, he ended up making a very fun wish fulfillment story with the right amount of cheese and the right amount of surprising jump scares. Remember the scene where Green Goblin horrific murders the Oscorp board of directors? One of them was in a wheelchair, and it definitely seems like an inspiration for this Shazam scene. These board members get torn to pieces by the demonic Seven Deadly Sins, and the film's creative team put a lot of work into designing each element, their skin texture, the hair, the bumps, the amount of saliva in their mouths, to make them comparable evils that emerge from the body, but just enough variation to tell them part if you look closely. Gluttony is a big flabbo, obviously. Prize stands proudly with large wings. Greed has multiple arms, more things to claw at riches with. Lust has a salacious venom-like tongue. I too thought lust would be hotter. Wrath is a hulking rage monster. Now, Envy is the run to the litter, smaller, thinner, hanging back, often hiding inside Savannah as his primary vice, because Envy, by his nature, lacks what the others possess. And Sloth is a bit harder to make out. He's another big guy, but his arms lazily dangle with tentacle fingers that mop the floor. You can see him a bit more clearly later on. Meanwhile, Shazam and Freddy test out powers set to Queen's Don't Stop Me Now. The skate ramp where they test flight has Arion written in graffiti on the side. Arion is actually a character from the DC Comics, an Atlantean sorcerer who has been both a hero and a villain in different series. Freddy uploads these videos to YouTube where he can see all his alternate names for this superhero. Thundercrack, Captain Thunder, Captain Sparklefingers, Sir Zapsalot, Mr. Philadelphia. There's also Zapton America, a nod to our boy Cap, and Power Boy, perhaps a nod to Power Man, aka Luke Cage from the Marvel world. It seems like the name that sticks for now is Red Cyclone, which is a nod to a more obscure DC figure, Red Tornado. Really, all of these jokes are making light of the confusion over Shazam slash Captain Marvel's name over the years, and the fact that Shazam tends to come up as a silly superhero reference in past genre films. Up, up and away, Lip! 
Shazam! Shazam and Freddy visit a real estate office hoping to buy a lair. They mention wanting it hidden behind a waterfall, a reference to the Batcave. And in the scene, Freddy now wears another Aquaman shirt, Atlantis lifeguard. I want that. Later, when Billy realizes he can just ditch school, look at the school bus behind him. Denny Bus Lines. That's a nod to veteran comic book writer Denny O'Neill. And from this point on into the third act, Freddy now wears a Superman shirt, perhaps a signal that this will be the day he Supermans up with his own Shazam powers. Shazam hangs out at the top of the steps to the art museum, showing off to Eye of the Tiger, lightning with my hands. There's another tiger reference for you. Plus, earlier Shazam mentions that this is a spot that Rocky ran to the top of in his famous montage, and Eye of the Tiger was the theme song for Rocky III, recorded by Survivor specifically for that movie. He accidentally zaps a bus, causing it to crash through the barrier at the top of an overpass, and Shazam catching it here evokes the classic moment Christopher Reeve's Superman caught the bus falling off the Golden Gate Bridge in the Richard Donner Superman. Savannah finds him after this, leading to Shazam Sam discovering his flight power and a fight crashing through Philadelphia skyscrapers, similar to the memorable Superman Zod battle in Man of Steel that used the buildings of Metropolis like Sloppy Joe's in a food fight. This fight spills over into a mall toy store where shelves are lined with DC merch, costumes and toys for various Justice League members. And as we were promised, there's a very fun homage to Big. Shazam and Savannah briefly run onto a giant floor keyboard, just like Tom Hanks and Rob Aloja. Probably too much to ask for Savannah and Shazam's footwork to lead to heart and soul or chopsticks and hopefully deleted scenes. When Billy disappears in the crowd at the mall, notice this screen in the background showing this animation. This cartoon is David Sandberg's first short film. It's all in Swedish, but it seems delightful. Back at home, Billy's foster family sees the news broadcast reported by Galaxy Broadcasting Systems. Galaxy is the name of the TV station in the comics. And when Billy returns, Eugene shares with them the information about his biological parents, his mother's current address. And he says that his father was named named C.C. Batson. C.C. is a nod to C.C. Beck, comic artist and co-creator of the Captain Marvel character back in 1939. Billy's mother disappoints him again because she's a garbage person, and her garbage boyfriend is actually a vocal cameo by David Sandberg. But this disappointment is an important step for Billy's maturation, symbolized by him handing off his compass ball to her. Just like Savannah let go of his magic eight ball the moment he severed ties with his family holding him back, allowing him to redefine himself as a supervillain, Billy now does the same, redefining himself as a superhero. And this leads to the definitive supercharge moment in every superhero movie, where Billy trusts way too much in the power of Zeus to hit him mid-suicide jump. But this is a true leap of faith. Bruce Wayne jumping to freedom in The Dark Knight Rises. Actually, the framing of Billy as he steps toward the edge of the rooftop mirrors the framing that we've seen in parallel moments for every other past DCEU hero. Shazam ends up back in the Rock of Eternity with Savannah and the Seven Deadly Sins, and the Batarang makes a great comeback. Between the Batarang and the smushed Superman bullet, I just love how Freddy's collectibles end up coming back into the story as key plot devices. Like the image of these smush bullets is the moment that Shazam realizes his bullet immunity in the convenience store, and the Batarang reveals Savannah's weakness that the guy can bleed. A symbol of Superman to show strength, a symbol of Batman to show vulnerability. As Shazam escapes with the Foster siblings, they pass a series of Monsters Inc. style doors. One contains a bunch of crocodiles playing cards, like I guess the dog painting. But this is actually a reference to the Crocodile Men from the DC Comics. Another door shows a deep fog with some nasty tentacled monster. This could be another horror homage to Stephen King's The Mist, a really underrated film by Frank Darabont. The action returns to the Christmas village at the carnival as Billy slash Shazam comes full circle with his origin. He even crashes back into the same balloon dart booth and he gives the stuffed tiger that he wanted to this little girl to keep her calm. This whole third act works really well largely because so much of it is callbacks to past moments. Billy catches the punch by Savannah, mirroring Savannah catching his punch earlier, and he powers up his foster siblings by saying all hands on deck, reusing his foster father's hands-in call for grace before meals, something he never took part in, now finally bringing Billy into the family. And yeah, all the kids shouting, Billy! Instead of Shazam, awesome. So all the kids power up to adult versions of themselves. Shazam Darla is Megan Good. Shazam Eugene is Ross Butler. Shazam Mary is Michelle Borth. And Pedro and Freddy's casting is especially significant. Pedro is played by DJ Catrona, who was originally announced as Superman in George Miller's 2007 Justice League Mortal film that never happened, unfortunately. And Freddy is Adam Brody, the OC, who was cast as The Flash in that movie and looks freakishly like an older Jack Dylan Grazer. Perfect casting. 
As the family takes on the seven deadly sins, Shazam and Savannah's fight moves over to downtown Philly. The hilarious gag is Savannah giving his evil speech too far away for Shazam to hear it. A boy plays with Superman and Batman action figures, clashing them into each other, perhaps recreating their battle in Batman v Superman. When Eugene blasts one of the sins, he shouts, Hadouken! A nod to Street Fighter. And later, after Shazam holds Savannah by the neck and pulls out the Eye of Sin, Eugene says, Fatality! A nod to Mortal Kombat, which we actually saw them playing earlier on. But the way Shazam ultimately defeats Savannah is interesting. Throughout the film, we see him use most of his powers. The strength of Hercules, the stamina of Atlas, the power of Zeus, the courage of Achilles, the speed of Mercury, but not often the wisdom of Solomon. It's kind of stupid, actually, like all kids are, to be fair. But in this moment, Shazam slash Billy cleverly invokes wisdom by taunting the envy out of Savannah so that Savannah is vulnerable. And notice how envy pops out of Savannah's face, much like the random Bilbo Baggins jump scare in Fellowship of the Ring. <sighs> Ugh. And I suppose in that moment, you could argue that the ring was inspiring envy in Bilbo. Envy mixed with greed. Mm, pretty much all the sins. The final scene returns to the school where the foster kids join together at one table. And Shazam helps Freddy, who now wears a Wonder Woman shirt here, deliver on his promise for him to show up at lunch, along with a celebrity cameo by the Man of Steel carrying a lunch tray. They had to show Superman from the neck down here due to contract disputes with Henry Cavill. So they had Zach Levi's stunt guy step in as a body double. Now, here's what I'm curious about from you guys. Over the years, the wizard could afford to be picky about his champion. He turned down everyone. But he ended up settling for Billy Batson after being forced to, since Savannah freed the seven deadly sins. Billy wasn't exactly the noblest boy scout out there. So do you think Billy would have been seduced by the Eye of Sin, the way Savannah was? And do you think young Savannah could have been a worthy champion if the wizard was as desperate as he was with Billy? Comment down below with your thoughts. Follow me on Instagram and Twitter at EA Voss. And subscribe to New Rockstars for deep dives and everything you love. Thanks for watching. Bye.